Greetings, outcasts, free thinkers, narrative questioners, dot connectors, and genuinely open minded and outright curious inhabitants of whatever realm we exist in at the moment. You are about to embark on another free first hour episode of The Night. If you find yourself wanting to dig deeper and have the desire to join the conversation during our monthly Melt meetups, you might want to consider becoming a monthly subscriber. For as little as three lousy Babylon hokey pokey tokens per month, you can have access to full length, early and exclusive episodes. Just visit patreon.com slash the melt podcast or click the link in the episode notes to set the process in motion. It's simple, painless, and very well might make you feel tingly inside. So without further ado, please enjoy the show. This is Hunter Muse. And this is Chris Snipes. And you are listening to The Melt. foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather and he who controls the weather will control the world i got something to say i want to know how come the fascist pigs have been seeding the clouds right. the last hour the airplanes air. going over Hello? twice with, the, with all with all the smoke coming out of them seeding the clouds and i want to know you know why that stuff is going down man and why doesn't the media report that stuff to the people man I'm telling you what happened. The planes come over an hour and a half and they've seen all the clouds. It's the second time they've seen People of unknown origin were (laughs) seeding the clouds over the air. I don't know what they hope to prove, man. Forget being on cloud nine, we are on cloud 12. Because that's how many new types of clouds have been added to this historic update. Come on, people, just get the shot. If I had time to speak directly to each of you on national television, I would. Oh, which reminds me, I'm supposed to pass along this message. Uh, Uncle Jeff, please get the vaccine. Otherwise, you can't come to my head writer's wedding. There's going to be a shrimp tower. Who are you? I am me, the Omicron variant. I came to get you sick and make you miss a lot of parties and stuff. Oh, thank goodness. I got worried for a second. Wait, why are you not screaming? I am the Omicron variant. Man, let me get you a drink. Like, Everyone usually runs away from me. Well, I'm not as worried because I have the updated booster. Everyone should check to see if they're eligible like I was. Getting boosted can help protect you from getting really sick from you. Even my BA4 and my BA5 variants? Even those, buddy. That's hard to hear, but thank you for telling me. Can I have a hug? <laughs> no, uh, but you can have a beer. There you go. Omicron variant, can I ask you a personal question? <laughs> Anything. It seems like you could have a lot more free time. What are you going to do with it? Well, I always wanted to be a braid dancer. You want to be a braid dancer? Well, then get out there and break. Sponsored by Pfizer and BioNTech. I'm Nicole Kidman, and I am going to eat a four-course meal of bugs. More and more, the connections between chemtrails, 5G, GMOs, dual-use technology, the current vax push, and body dysphoria seem to be all leading back to the same transhumanist agenda. Many of these deal with the elements of electromagnetism, frequency, and nanotechnology. 
As the 20th and 21st centuries have progressed, there has been a concerted effort to remove humanity from its place in nature. More recently, that is manifested by steeping the natural world and all of its occupants in frequencies, substances, and technology that seek to utilize our organic ecosystems as batteries, conductors, transmitters, and ultimately as manipulatable avatars that will be inextricably interwoven with state-sanctioned biotech capable of monitoring our bodies and our thoughts. Much of humanity seems to be unquestioningly on the same page as the big pharma-funded oligarchy and swayed so hopelessly by their propagandized corporate media that they are able to usher their agenda in right under the noses of the masses, who seem to be taking everything at face value and who seem to somehow have learned to trust in institutions and corrupt political systems without hesitation. But perhaps we should shift our focus to those who are striving to learn more about our reality by doing their own research, fueled by curiosity and a healthy distrust of those who have everything to gain by our compliance and obedience. Today's guest, author and ardent researcher Elana Freeland, joins us today to talk about her latest book, Geoengineered Transhumanism, How the Environment Has Been Weaponized by Chemicals, Electromagnetism, and Nanotechnology for Synthetic Biology. I start off the conversation by asking Alana what brought her to this work. I've been involved in writing about geoengineering, or chemtrails as we used to call it, Mm -hmm. uh, for 12, 13 years now. And um, I've published uh, three books. The first two were published by Feral House uh, when Adam Parfrey was alive. Uh, And uh, yep, there they are. And um, then now I've come out with the third book, which is uh, what I call the Bible. Mm. Uh, This is where I I return to the scene of the crime of, of, aerosol uh, delivery of synthetic biology for us to breathe in, drink, and eat uh, as a host for experiments going on by the government and by defense contractors. That's very important to know because the the amalgam of uh, what's called the, what is it, private Public private partnerships, mm-hmm. <laughs> such a lovely term, uh, <laughs> that they work together. Um, this has been going on longer than I've been writing. Certainly, the first person on the scene of the crime was Clifford Carnicum, the independent scientist. Uh, he had worked for the Department of, of Defense for a while and, and the Bureau of Land Management as a scientist and had left their employ and was on his own when I encountered him in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, you know how life is, uh, at a breakfast. <laughs> and I had already been asked by Adam Parfrey if I would write a book on chemtrails for him. And, uh, and then boom. Life sends me Clifford Carnicum, the uh, exact person that I would need to know. Uh, and so Clifford and I um, began to compare notes. I had I had a second major in biology in college, in undergrad, um, and I, I was fascinated by biology. I didn't know yet that most of my biology would be pretty useless now uh, because we are moving from molecular biology to digital biology, Mm -hmm. uh, and that includes the synthetic biology. So uh, so meeting Clifford was the beginning of my uh, deep study. We started with the the wine test, the red wine test, where you clean your mouth out really well, and then you slosh uh, a mouthful of red wine or grape juice and uh, for about five minutes and then spit it into a clean jar or a Petri dish and, uh, and then wait for it to settle and then see the Morgellons creatures crawling across the bottom of the jar. Uh, very, uh, very wakeful experience for me. I bet. And then we drew blood uh, and uh, looked at 
my blood and, and the blood of others under, under the microscope. And there I saw the same creature uh, sucking the iron out of my red blood cells. So uh, this was, that would have been from the late 90s on that the Morgellons creature, which was uh, definitely genetically engineered, um, coming down from the sky with uh, the um, nano heavy metals, with uh, red red blood cells, uh, all sorts of gooey looking things that now I realize were probably early hydrogel. Uh, and, um, I, uh, I wrote the chemtrails heart book in 2014. And that's basically, I call it a primer. You can see, uh, pretty much how, how extensive, uh, the whole system is in, in um, in an elementary way. Mm. I explain hurricanes in that book. I, I talk about the, the big hurricanes, Katrina, mm-hmm. Sandy, uh, the one down in Haiti, uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh Fukushima. Mm-hmm. I talk about, uh, how they were all harp generated, how harp does it, uh, and, um, uh, how the whole harp technology machine around the world works in tandem. Uh, and then, um, I had a chapter on, um, Bernard Eastland's patent, breaking down the patent to see that um one of the major parts of harp is that it uh it it has to do with our resonance as human beings we we pick up easily on other frequencies and this had to do with cyclo- cyclotronic uh resonance uh that harp generates and and that you know it was shut down for a few years a lot of people heard that and uh in 2013 it was shut down and then then it was fired back up a uh, very short time later recalibrated and uh is in full operation now it is basically a weapon system not just for weather manipulation uh it has many many uh, amazing um uh, abilities with uh other if it works uh, in concert with uh, other uh, ionospheric heaters. And we have ionospheric heaters now all around the world, uh, not not as big and powerful as uh, HARP is, but uh, I hear rumors that the Chinese are making one that makes HARP look like kindergarten. So mm. uh, anyway, it's catching on to the entire uh, world, not just the United States. Uh, and then I went on from there, through uh, being on coast to coast after that book, the first book came out, I encountered um, a guy named Billy Hayes. Uh, he's known as the Harp Man mm-hmm. because he was the team leader in building the uh, the phased array antenna farm that is known as Harp, the high frequency active rural research project up in Gakona, Alaska. And Billy became invaluable to me because he said, he said, look, he says. Uh, you 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 did great in the first book, and I'm here to help you with the second book mm. to show you what this what the, the bigger plans for right. this are. Mm-hmm. And so, in the second book, Under an Ionized Sky, which came out in 2018, uh, it's a very important book because I basically spell out how the space fence works. That's a um, a term uh, used uh, by Lockheed Martin since uh, the uh, SDI program uh, during the Reagan era, the Strategic Defense Initiative, mm-hmm. and um, the uh, the uh, ability of the space fence to be what, what we call down here on the uh, Earth uh, layer, we call it the smart grid. Mm-hmm. And I explain, thanks to Billy, who by the way, is an MK Ultra survivor. Mm. He uh, had been programmed as a child from eight years on to uh, to comprehend everything about electromagnetics. Uh, I mean, to ask Billy a question about anything having to do with this technology, and he would recite chapter and verse just like he was reading out of a book. That's mm-hmm. what MK Ultra programming can do. Mm-hmm. So he was, uh, he led me through and I did my own research and then, uh, I checked things where I wasn't sure on sure ground with him and mm-hmm. he would 
he would uh, help me with that. And so uh, totally invaluable. Without him, I couldn't have written that book. Um, As for the third book, uh, I stopped doing radio interviews with Billy after uh, 2018 because the CIA, which still controlled him, would uh, make sure he had grand mal seizures when our radio interviews would begin. Oh my God. And I really was afraid he was going to die on the air. Mm. Uh, and oh. um, and it disturbed greatly the radio uh, hosts as well. Mm. So I pulled away. Uh, and then Billy died last January. Oh. Uh, he was His body was riddled with tumors from mm. all the microwave uh, technology he had been. He'd worked on 240 projects around the world for the CIA uh, because the CIA was the original um, force behind the geoengineering effort. Um, So what we see today with this latest uh, lockdown from three years ago and the inoculation aspect of the synthetic biology is we see the culmination of this uh, program, in my opinion, this is my opinion. Uh, and and now uh, we are all plugged in to the Space Fence edifice. Mm-hmm. And, and um, I was just out to lunch with a fellow and we were talking about uh, how some people seem to be um, extremely controlled and others like myself uh, have freedom. Uh, not to say I'm not at times uh, given uh, electromagnetic weapon assaults mm-hmm. to remind me of, I guess, to remind me of my place in the world. Um, but um, basically, I still have my free will. And um, I am I am plugged in, I'm sure of it. But uh, not to a slavish extent at this point. Sure. Now, what I make clear in this third book, which is the super, super most important part of this, is the uh, very few people know that we went through a revolution in the 90s of a, uh, the nanotech revolution, I call it. Uh, nanotechnology is in uh, all that is dumped down on us, and we have been breathing it now into our bodies and brains for almost 30 years now. With the nanotechnology in place, uh, then um, uh, all of the control element of the space fence can be fully operant. Uh, and that that includes, uh, like, now they have what's called precision medicine, uh, uh, where, you know, you can, you can have time capsule drugs, uh, given to you, and <clears throat> it will only start uh, going into your system when someone at uh, Precision Medicine Central decides that now the time capsule can go off in your body, and that's all done remotely. So that gives you an idea of how this is to be done. Uh, it's all remote. It's all AI systems. And um, I believe the globalists' idea is to uh, make a world that uh, is basically a machine, and mm. we are we are just other parts of the machine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I I try to uh, this last book was 650 pages, uh, and is pretty daunting for a, a time in which most people don't even read. And if they do read with the best of intent, uh, they can't retain what they're reading, they can't concentrate, and they can't remember what they've read. So uh, now I've been approached by Inner Traditions, which is a a publishing firm, uh, and um, they have asked to do a second edition of the book I just came out with, which is entitled um, Geoengineered Transhumanism, how the environment has been weaponized by chemicals, electromagnetism, and nanotechnology for synthetic biology. Big title, big book. Uh, what uh, Inner Traditions has proposed, and I've now agreed to it, is for me to write two smaller books, mm. to break, basically break the book in two, 
mm-hmm. and write the a geoengineering book that references synthetic biology, and then to write a synthetic biology book that references geoengineering. And to use a lot of the material from the previous big book, Mm-hmm. Uh, but I will have a lot of new in it as well. Plus, I'm I'm going to rearrange the formatting uh, for this problem that readers have of making it easier to uh, go through the book, easier to keep all the topics sort of uh, uh, concisely put together, mm-hmm. uh, maybe less uh, technical terms, less technical explanations of examples um i'm I'm kind of way, what making my way through that right now actually because i have a due date coming up uh and um doing the geoengineering book first uh and the working title at this point is as above so below from the secret space program to geoengineered transhumanism um, and then I will bring out the other one, uh, and that one will be quite different because I don't know if you know, but I'm a pretty long-term student of Rudolf Steiner. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I was a Waldorf teacher for years. I've helped uh-huh. start four Waldorf schools in Washington State. So uh, I think I'm going to go more esoteric in that book and mm, talk fantastic. about uh, the human body, the cosmos, disease, what disease really is. Uh, and um, all from more of an esoteric point of view. Uh, and we'll see how that goes. But this company, Inner Traditions, very interestingly, I, I remember when they, I believe they're the ones who came out with the Dancing Wooly Masters yes. Yes. years uh-huh. ago, yep. which I loved that book. Yeah. So they do books that are science and technology with a mm-hmm. spiritual bent. Yes. And so uh, it seems a a natural for me to just come out more with uh, esoterics. And the name of the book at this point uh, is The Nanosynthetic Biology Assault, Confronting Transhumanism with Consciousness. I love it. So we'll give it a try. Yeah, that sounds very promising. We interview a lot of uh, inner traditions authors, so... Oh, for, great. For, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Well, that's exciting. And those two are going to come out sometime next year? Well, that's up to them. Okay. Uh, because, I, again, you know, you pass over the copyright and yeah, <laughs> pretty it's much it's just along for the ride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was very excited to find out that you uh, were involved with Waldorf and, and Rudolf Steiner. Uh, my kids go to uh, Waldorf school, or my oldest one used to, but they only go up to eighth grade, so my youngest one is still there, so... Yeah, great. Very nice. Yeah. So I still think, despite the liberalization uh, in some ways and the loss of a lot of Steiner aspects, mm-hmm. uh, which I, of course, do not approve of, mm-hmm. of course. as if it matters, uh, um, I still feel that it's really the best place for a child to start learning all they need to learn in an atmosphere where at least there are, at this point anyway, <laughs> no computers in the kindergartens yes and uh and a lot of uh a, a basis on nature and the steiner curriculum up through grade 5 absolutely uh and uh that i'm hoping will stay relatively the way it has been uh while we go through all these changes Indeed. i was surprised that they were masking the children and that they kind of complied with the whole mask Facts. mandate yes. and and temperature well, checks at the door and all of that nonsense. I agree. I agree. And and they're also very influenced by. I hear. I'm not involved in at all. It's it's like when I go to one of the schools that I helped to start, and you know, I can see furniture that I helped build and things Aww. like that. <laughs> um, it's like it was someone else. Yeah, I have sure. no. Uh, I, I have no attachment whatsoever. I, I loved it while I was there, and the children, bless their hearts, they they helped me to heal my childhood while I tried to help them with their childhood. And uh, I feel that it was all just uh, oh, God's grace, really, that I was in that movement as long as I was. But I also recognize when it was time to go. Now, yes, I hear there are the gender thing, mm-hmm. the race thing, mm-hmm. the mask thing, all that. Uh, all and um, it's 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 obvious that us old timers 
where my main job as sort of faculty head was to make sure I felt, uh, besides all the conflict resolution stuff, is um, is to make sure that we kept reading Steiner. Because I don't believe you can have, you won't have a real Steiner school without Steiner. <laughs> exactly. I mean, you know, it kind of, it's kind of a no-brainer, it looks to me like. <laughs> so um, what I think people don't realize is they have cut, in America, we've cut uh, off the idea that things can't be a technique if they are not still connected to the mother source. Yes. And um, so you're going to have something different. But I would think it will still be better than uh, the poor beleaguered public schools mm-hmm. in America and uh, possibly others of which I'm ignorant. So um, anyway, I, I'm so out of that loop now. And I, I'm i so grateful that I was able to uh, be involved while it was still a Steiner school. And I, I had to hold the line. I could feel the pressure all the mm-hmm. time. Uh, and not to say I'm the paragon of anthroposophy. I don't mean that at all. But I definitely am one of those people that um, I'm not a smorgasbord spiritual type. Mm. Uh, when I go for something, I have checked it out thoroughly and and I'm committed. And I will take it to the end. Uh, so I realized it was time to go and get back to writing because I had been a writer before uh, I'd been a journalist before uh, I was um, a Waldorf teacher. So I, I just returned to writing. And now I uh, I, I actually um, write books for people. I'm a ghost writer. And I also edit people's books for money. Mm. So how did you get involved in the, the chemtrail geoengineering world? How did that start for you? Well, it, it started with uh, Adam Parfrey. Uh, who uh, at Farrell House? Who I when I was I was living in England for a few years and and um, I did some work on my own of a guy named uh, James Shelby Downard mm-hmm. yeah. and Shelby uh, was just a, an amazing um, guy. He had a very badly written autobiography of up to his thirty fifth year or something and. I went ahead and ed- I, it was so badly written that I just went ahead and start editing it as I, as I read it. <laughs> uh, and then I sent it to Adam and said, you know, why don't, would please publish a clean <laughs> copy of Shelby's life? You know, here, here it is, you know, and I sent him both copies so mm-hmm. that he could see what I had done to the book. Uh, and then Adam, I think, threw me a bone and said, Hey, can you write a book on chemtrails for me? And, uh, and that was, you know, it, it's funny in publishing, uh, where when you have someone who owns your copyright, <laughs> that's supposed to mean that you're really a serious writer. I'm not quite sure how that happened, but, <laughs> um, Adam became my publisher for two books and, um, I was very grateful to him. Uh, it was a, a strange, uh, marriage because w- I'm writing uh, books with masses of footnotes mm. uh, and uh, most of the books that Farrell House published at that time were pretty wild and crazy oh, yeah. uh, and yet uh, it was because Adam was a huge believer in the First Amendment mm. he, he, one of the reasons that he did that was he said hey these people you know they can't get their ideas out there and we need we need a rich uh, field of ideas and I'm not going to sit here and you know and, and make moral judgments on people so um so he um I, I admired him uh, and then uh when he died I, I kind of just felt that I wanted to uh take the book back uh take my I, I couldn't I couldn't get my copyrights back without buying them back but I felt that I for the third book I would go on my own again mm-hmm I had been on my own for the Sub Rosa America series, which I never talk about, but which is a fantastic uh, uh, study of what happened to America since Kennedy's assassination. Mm. Uh, and, you know, it's uh, 1300 words over four books. 
Uh, it has a cult following of maybe a few hundred people. I've never really put anything out there to sell it. It just sort of sells by word of mouth. But it is uh, it is a, a, a tremendous history in a fictional format where I could present the 60s generation that I experienced, not the time or uh, Newsweek magazine versions right. of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, mm-hmm. but the uh, the version of where there well, there was plenty of that too. But they, where it was really uh, the spiritual quest, uh, politics, uh, incredible camaraderie, uh, long discussions into the night of philosophy and uh, and and the world and, and human humanity. So I, I wrote those books to represent the generation I experienced Mm -hmm. along with a mass of history uh, for which I read, I read multiple books uh, and, and many, many articles. Um, And um, I'm so great. I I really feel they are my magnum opus at this point. Uh, even though in the geoengineering field, I have to say one of the strangest things that must have occurred to you too. Uh, I'm the only person writing about this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I am the only person writing books on this. Uh, and um, I'm taking it further than a lot of my colleagues in the uh, anti-geoengineering movement, which is basically an internet movement. Mm-hmm. Never met these guys, but we've, talked on the phone, we've done uh, Skypes, we've done lots of uh, emails. Uh, they're pretty much sticking with the weather. Uh, and I'm uh, I'm plowing ahead into the other uh, six aspects that Clifford Carnicom made clear were going on with geoengineering and uh, were just as serious, if not much more serious than uh, engineering the weather. But yeah, okay, so um, that's how I got into it. And and I have to say the bold statement, which to me is not bold at all, uh, all the weather, all the weather is engineered now. There is no natural weather that you and I will experience. If you live in the South Pacific, where there seems to be uh, a place where the natural weather sort of blooms out of the ocean and the air, Mm -hmm. Uh, by the living, uh, beautiful Mother Earth. Uh, yes, there is that. There is her breathing process, which is what weather really should be or was for what, what, thousands of years? I'd say millions of years. Now, uh, that natural weather is quickly, uh, grabbed up by geoengineers and U.S. Navy ships and merchant marines. And, uh, immediately subjected to technology to, uh, to turn it to their will. And, uh, and that's how it is. That's a daily, that's a daily affair. So when do you believe that started? Do you think that we have ever in our lives, in our lifetimes, have we ever seen natural weather? Well, I know I'm 75 years old. I was born in 1947, the year that the National Security Act and the CIA were born. Um, I know I saw natural clouds. I know I saw natural weather. Not that they weren't experimenting, having sort of limited experiments going on Mm -hmm. in both world wars and Vietnam. Yes. Uh, we all remember Popeye Mm -hmm. of, uh, of washing out the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Yep. to control, by the way, the heroin uh, uh, production mm-hmm. and sales. Yeah. Um, and uh, the weather now uh, is is completely controlled. But uh, uh, when did that happen? I would say it happened as soon as Bernard Eastland got um, – as soon as they got Bernard Eastland's patent in full operation after having built out the uh, the phased array antenna farm in Gakona, Alaska, and they had the Arecibo uh, radio uh, telescope uh, operation in Puerto Rico, mm-hmm. and they had several northern uh, northern latitude uh, ionosphere keters that were involved in Norway, Russia etc. Um, 
then uh, once they got that started up, I would say it was probably 1990 to 95. Uh, Nick Begich and Gene Manning came out with Angels Don't Play This Harp uh, in 1995. And Nick um, had a massive footnotes of uh, of research that he had done on it. It was built by then, and and uh, everything began then. Yeah, that's when I'd say it began. So so we're looking at three decades, and um, it's been we've been breathing the stuff that they're dropping on us all this time uh, in nano particulate size, which can easily go through the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and the waking up to this, I mean, it's almost like, it's almost like if you can do something in full sight, then you can make it disappear much easier than if you have to, uh, you know, keep sitting on it somewhere. Exactly. Um, so, uh, there has been no respite. This has been front and center. Uh, Catherine Austin Fitz has said again and again that the secret space program probably is the the, culp- the main culprit that made off with at least $21 trillion stolen from the American budget. Uh, and uh, And the secret space program entails, according to her and Joseph Farrell, entails um, a breakaway civilization, a whole a whole cotillion of uh, alternate thinking uh, elites with a lot of money uh, who I think we've been seeing a lot of the last few years who finally have come out uh, with guns blazing uh, and um, so I think uh I think it's all about transhumanism. Uh well it's about controlling the entire planet. It's called uh doctrine of full spectrum dominance. It's a military doctrine. It it's a spa- a secret space program doctrine. I have met several MK Ultra survivors who are still under the thumb of the secret space program. They were programmed under the secret space program. This is the the much younger version of MK Ultra now, uh, but they have completely much more sophisticated means of control now since they can control everything remotely and with nanotechnology. So, um, <clears throat> that, that's, uh, that would be how, that's how I see it as far as the timetable. Secret space program started back in 1937 when we brought Werner von Braun over to Mm -hmm. run our rocket program. Mm -hmm. People think he came at the end of the war. No, he came in 1937. He was a, an SS Nazi and we turned everything over to the, not the SS Nazis, about 1500 of them that we brought in under paperclip. Uh, Everything was turned over to them by the time MK ultra started, which would be 1953 and uh and we have not really had a republic since then really it was the national security act that destroyed the republic what do you think the the behind the whole all these different elements that are going into the transhumanism uh movement um which we can parse out as we talk here but what do you think the driving force is is it is it simply money and greed is it power or something much darker, like something almost oh. of, of an occult nature. Yeah, it's a, of an occult nature. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and uh, it's this this desire that we're seeing unfold right now. A lot of people think that uh, this effort the last three years has failed. That's not how I see it. I see that they succeeded beyond their wildest dreams. Mm-hmm. Exactly, uh, and and that we haven't seen the last of this by any means. Um, I think. They want to thumb their noses at the gods, the gods being the divine world that exists, whether Americans continue to laud themselves with their materialism or not. Uh, 
you know, you can you can say that something doesn't exist, but that's all that you're doing is saying it doesn't exist. The divine world definitely exists. Yes. I've had many experiences of that truth. So, uh, you know, I'm banking my whole life on that. Mm. Um, they want to be gods on this earth. Uh, okay, they say to themselves. So there's a divine world. Uh, well, they can have other worlds, at least until we get there such as, you know, the the world on Mars, the world on Mercury, the world on Jupiter, all these planets. Um, but we want this one. And we're going to have it one way or another. What we don't want is the divine in the human beings that we're running. Yes. We want that divine completely obliterated and another divine put in. Uh, and um, that's how they see their nanotechnology. I mean, you know, I'm studying the nanotechnology right now as I'm writing the section on nanotechnology or rewriting it. And really, when you think about it, the Manhattan Project was also another program that took place at the atomic level. And that's what uh, nano uh, bots are, is they are uh, built by laying one atom next to another atom, next to another atom, next to another atom, and then various levels. And uh, so what does it mean? What does it mean to build something at the atomic level? Well, what it means is you are at the very nether threshold of what is natural. And you are beginning to be in a uh, a a quantum uh, alien level. Uh, so so if there if that's true, and I'm pretty sure it is, um, by getting us to breathe in all these nanobots. Uh, we now have within us, and these nanobots are, they're not individually intelligent, but they have a consciousness as a swarm. It, they use the word swarm a lot. And that's sort of like a collect, like a, a group soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You think of it as a group soul. And, um, they can be easily run by, uh, 5G, 6G systems because the 5G, has uh, the millimeter wave. You need very small waves for very intense uh, uh, control. Mm -hmm. And then the 6G, which is now fully operant. They're not telling us, but it's fully operant. And that's uh, that's a, 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 a terahertz. And, and that rips your DNA apart. Like when you go through those machines at the airport, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, which I always get the pat down and I always tease the agents. They say, do you mind doing it in public? I say, no, it's the first time I've been touched in months. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know it doesn't bother me. Go ahead, touch away. Um, but um, this, this nanotechnology is, is in a way their way of getting their divine, their satanic divine into us and then they can begin to work with it and they have a lot of projects and as you know now with the millions who have been inoculated these are all experiments and uh you know what they're yes they're they want a a, a new generation uh a first generation of a transhuman mm. that's definitely going on and then they have other projects that are are going on through the inoculations and the the various things that they've put into the serums, which now are coming out as as scientists and researchers look through their uh, their electron electron microscope. So uh, so you know they're they have a lot of big plans. These are these are brotherhoods. These are secret societies that uh, have have never given up the idea of uh, absolute control over planet Earth. 
they are um, they have been strengthened by the uh, the Kardashev model. Uh, he was a Soviet uh, astrophysicist, um, and his um, his th- three point plan for for a real space age, which is the first one, is full spectrum dominance over your planet, planet Earth. And that that full spectrum dominance, that spectrum means electromagnetic spectrum. That means that you control all the frequencies in your planet. Uh, And, and you, you know, that's, that's from the, the butterfly to the behemoth, you know, it's it's everything. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then the second phase is, uh, is full spectrum dominance over your star, over the sun. Now I show in the geoengineering book, this third one, um, there are a lot of experiments going on with the sun because it's plasma. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of experiments going on about plasma because plasma is, uh, is sort of their, uh, their Holy grail, I would say. Uh, And then the third step in Kardashev's model is the uh, full spectrum dominance over the galaxy. And, you know, at that point we're ready to laugh, you know, I mean, come on, Uh, how do you do that? Well, how do you do that? unless you realize that it's not a matter of miles and of space, it's a matter of frequency Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, being everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Uh, So, so the secret space program has, uh, is, has been invaluable. It is, you know, to me, the geoengineering is the handmaiden Mm -hmm. of the secret space program uh, because that entails the control over the earth. So the brotherhoods, secret societies have always wanted to, uh, you know, go to the moon, go to Mars, uh, set up businesses, you know, uh, capitalism, <laughs> more capitalism and, uh, on the other planets. And, uh, they have their dreams, which are basically always our nightmares. Mm-hmm. That's kind of how it works out. Um, uh, and, uh, and now they're making a big move. And I, I I am personally thrilled to be here because I didn't know that I would live long enough to see it. But of course, I knew it was coming. Uh, you know, if you do any amount of study of so-called conspiracy theory, like the Committee of 300 by John Coleman and, mm-hmm. you know, all the all the regular conspiracy books, you you see the Council on Foreign Relations, you see the Roundtable Group. You understand the history of many of these uh, these elite um, secret societies. Um, so uh, I'm I'm trying to build the picture, not to scare everybody, but to make it clear that if ever there was a time to develop your consciousness, this is it, uh, because we need all hands on deck. Uh, a lot of people don't believe it's possible that you could actually wipe out the entire human race and replace it with something uh, different. I I now see, of course, that that is very possible. And um, as far as, as far as the death rate and things, uh, which, you know, is unfortunately uh, part of this, that brings up a whole other question, which I will address in the synthetic biology book, uh, but not answer in any way. But what does this do to you after you're dead? If you have a life after you're dead, which I know you do, because I died in a wave in, at Makapu. Uh, when I was 22 mm. and was uh, zooming down that tunnel that you read about mm-hmm. and seeing the light at the end yeah, and going, yeah. I'm going home, I'm going home and <laughs> wow. being so excited to go home. And then suddenly I'm going backwards. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I ended up living, fortunately, because I realized that I had a big life ahead of me. Um, whether you believe there's a, uh, a life after death or not there is and and do these big pharma magicians alchemists 
black magic artists, do they have the capability to put into the serum something that will affect the problem of reincarnation? Because I've never believed that this was a depopulation, a, a culling. Yes, mm-hmm. they're not. They they, they will they like a culling, mm-hmm. uh, but no, it was not a depopulation. But the, if if it were, their main headache would be how do you kill off a bunch of people and make sure they're not going to come back? Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, it just it's just that's how it is. So now I uh, have read a couple things written by some Steiner people that make me realize that yes, they have put something into this serum that has an impact on the other side. Mm. I'm not surprised, uh, but I'm confirmed now Mm. that they have done that. Because if you look up the Greek for uh, the Greek root behind the word pharma, pharma, pharmacology, pharmaceutical, um, you see that it means um, spells. Mm -hmm. It means, uh, it means magical, uh, uh, impact and uh that 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 is the big pharma i know from having studied ig farben during world war ii uh thinking back over world war one which was completely a chemical war mm. yeah. that destroyed an entire generation of european youth world war ii uh completely uh pharmacological uh they're involved with big oil and then uh, wonderfully there was an account i read of the huge uh pedophile scandal that took place in belgium in 1990 i believe called the de true scandal in which mark de true played the role of uh, epstein pimping for the elites and picking up children for uh, satanic rituals in the castles there in Europe. Uh, and, and this fellow who did this research, and it's still up. This site is still up. I'm amazed. Uh, he names the owners of these castles, and they're all big pharma families. Wow. Not surprising. So, um, so I'm very clear on big pharma being one of the uh, greatest dark powers on the planet. And, uh, we've gotten to see a lot of them or of their henchmen anyway, uh, very recently. And, um, that this, uh, this ability to control humanity, yes, it has to do with enslavement. But again, I remind you that this, this idea of being gods on their own planet uh, is is a very driving force for many generations uh, because it would be the best that they're going to get. Uh, but if humanity awakens, and as you look around, you see people are awakening slowly, despite the fact that the mainstream media is completely controlled. Mm-hmm. Uh, people are awakening. It will never be all the masses. We can never expect that. There are many young souls here who don't know their way around at all here. And it, it always lies with those who, who are the older souls to pull the rest of humanity behind them. That's always been the way it is. And it's no different now. It's mainly that we need to get very serious very quickly and, uh, and really take hold of our lives. And, you know, if you have to give up your personal life in uh, for the sake of your public life, and that doesn't mean going and giving talks and marching in the streets or anything. There are many ways to work for the public without uh, being exposed uh, physically. Um, that Then so be it. You know, this is the time to shine. And, uh, and, and we have been... Just think about it. I mean, I I find it amazing. You arrive on this planet. Nobody tells you this fact, I'm going to say. But if you had known, would it have made a difference? Maybe. That you are going to be facing such diabolical powers that control 
all the money, all the minerals and and uh, and resources, uh, and and uh, and have have terrible plans for human. I mean, how how can you how can that be true? You come as a small child, you have a family, you get your start, you 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 have this entire propaganda of your nation that you know you can even you can be president of the united states you know right. all that yes. and, exactly. and and you you then have to make your way through all slog your way through all that all that rhetoric in order to get to the truth that the mythology of good versus evil is true yeah, and it's exactly. being acted out here, and now you're going to have to find out what new language it's using in this incarnation. You, you got used to the old one, but now you're going to have to learn a whole new, and you're going to have to be Sherlock Holmes times ten in order to be able to sleuth your way around and read disinformation and see what's the man behind the curtain is doing and etc. But if you really feel it. It's like, yeah, now I'm really on the trail. This <laughs> is really so, what's going on here. You've nailed it. And I think that, that in my experience, the people who are faring the best in the, these times are those who experienced early childhood trauma, those who were able to survive things that, are, that would seem unsurvivable. And I think that that has a lot to do with it is that it's easier to be skeptical and it's easier to see beyond that velvet curtain because you've already been betrayed. So the people that you were supposed to trust the most, when they screw you over, suddenly you start to say, well, maybe I shouldn't trust what consensus reality is telling me. Yeah, maybe. I think you're right. I think that if you can make it through early traumatization and make it conscious, that's very important. If you if you leave it buried uh, in the name of safety and security, uh, you won't go through what I think is an initiation rite. I think trauma is ac- actually an initiation rite that you go through, you get to the other side, you look back, you can name it. You can see the participants. You've got it. And now it transforms into a tremendous strength. Because I am, of course, a trauma survivor of my Navy intelligence father. Uh, you know, I mean, he was controlled by the Navy his whole life. And then he did to me what he did to me. And, and it crippled me in a certain area of life. But meanwhile, once I could get hold of what had happened to get my memories back, then uh, it added to the strength of my capability to serve the public. And I really, That's really how it worked. You're right. I think that the government and the military specifically, the part of their indoctrination and part of their training is to use their children in experimentation. My grandfather yes. was a career Navy man. He was... Uh, one of the founding members of the NSA, he totally tormented and tortured my mother, who turned around and really kind of opened the door for me understanding the MK Ultra program and that type of um, mind control, and was always very against media and music, and don't listen to that, don't watch that, that's programming you. Um, But she had her own trauma that she was dealing with. So I think there's a generational thing that happens and hopefully you evolve from that trauma, as you're saying, and that it's a form of a rite of passage. And I think that those of us who have that early sexual trauma or early physical trauma uh, have been bolstered in some way, and we are given this maybe additional sense. It's like not a sixth sense, but a seventh sense that ha- has kind of helped me to see through this veil. So when the, the, when the chemtrail thing started to happen, 
I would be out in public saying, don't you see what's going on? <laughs> don't you see this is happening? And what I am so uh, admiring of you is that you actually did the legwork. You, you've actually taken someone like me and you've reinforced what I have lost literally hundreds of friends over and been called crazy. Look, like, that's not happening. No, no, no. Because I think it's such a big thing that people don't know what to do with it. It's true. And they feel, most most people seem to feel powerless. Again, that's because of the materialistic lives that we live and the concepts that we're, we're willing to settle for as to what existence is without delving into the divine, without going into what is where the real power is, the big, the big guns. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so for me, uh, I, I think I will, I don't know about you, but I think I will write an autobiography someday simply because I don't think a life like I had will happen again Mm. uh, at all. It'll Mm. be something different. It won't be that there isn't somebody who's going to plow through the rite of passage of, uh, of their own trauma, uh, you know, going on now or in the future. But, uh, but I think you, you've, you've hit a really important point. And I, I hope that reaches your listeners who, who are afraid because uh, fear is, uh, is really, I, I don't have any fear. I've been, uh, uh, I've been targeted electromagnetically. I've been, uh, warned uh you know there are things they have to do for their job Mm -hmm. and then uh there are things i have to do for my job and that's as it is and it has always been thus Mm -hmm. there is no backing down when you serve the divine uh it is a privilege to serve the divine. And uh, it isn't that, you know, Moses came down off the mountain and announced it to me. It is very clear to me what I must do. And if I die during it, well, fine, I'm going home and I'll be back. Like, you know, like uh, what's his name said in the movies? Uh, I'll be back. Yeah. Uh, I'll be back. Uh, this is a long war. Yeah. This is a very long war. It goes on for generations and generations. And, uh, and, and, and what the human being is, we've lost sight of that. Uh, the human being is an extraordinary being. And, uh, Rudolf Steiner even says that the human being is the religion of the gods. Uh, why? Because we are spiritual beings who have chosen to incarnate into the material plane yeah. and to develop true spirituality while living in material bodies in a material world, not the easiest thing in the world to do. And uh, we are admired by the angels, the archangels. We are admired by the great powers for uh, our, (laughs) I guess, our stupidity, our naivete, our, uh, our ability to be flexible, to adjust to extraordinarily negative circumstances and find a way to survive. Uh, there are many things about the human being that are very admirable. And I do not judge uh, the reputation of humanity by these power mongers and, uh, that are at the top of the heap, having uh, one can only imagine how many people they destroyed in order to get where they are. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, I'd rather do it my way, uh, which is from the bottom up. And, uh, and find uh, a way to serve uh, without uh, ruling, mm-hmm. uh, truthfully, uh, to find a way to, uh, to do what is right and good and true, uh, where it leaves people free to choose or not choose. That freedom to choose, we don't arrive here, this is a real misconception, we don't arrive here with free will. No baby has free will. Mm-hmm. That must be developed through uh, tears and sweat and uh, and great striving through life to have real free will. Uh, 
Uh, and um, <clears throat> I can honestly say that now, by by this time in my life, and having done what I uh, did with my own suffering in in uh, in my own school of life, mm-hmm. uh, that I. I, I, I'm approaching having free will, uh, and uh, and I can I can honestly say that I am not tempted to power mm. at all. It's kind of laughable to me uh, that these these people uh, bend over back. But you know, elites. I happen to know uh, I've known a couple of, of very high elites uh, quite well regarding their biographies. And um, they are they are terribly programmed from day one. Mm-hmm. Sure. They don't have a chance yeah. to really break free, not at all. Uh, and so uh, I, I feel compassion for them, but that doesn't mean that I will close my eyes in a dark room with them. <laughs> exactly. Well, and these are our soul contracts. These are the things that we have signed off on. And I, I agree with you that there is no free will in the beginning, but I think part of the journey is accepting that and understanding that we have this level of curiosity that keeps us going. I'm really curious about the future, and I see them as predators. So I I kind of approach it that I'm in this natural environment with a predator and so i have to look at them with that that eye i don't think that the prey and predator relationship is one that is uh that the prey feels sorry for itself i think they understand the role and it's a decision that you make in a second by second on a second by second basis is how are you going to approach that? Are you just going to lay down and be eaten? Or are you going to fight for your last keep breath? Your, keep your wits about you. That's so true. That's so true. It's, it, that's a very good way of saying it, that there are many predators here and, uh, and it is not, this is not the fun and games place. We come to this earth as a school and, uh, and we develop here and for the sake of all humanity, for the sake of human evolution. And I simply don't want these, uh, predators to cut short our, uh, free will to even choose the bad, as I think many people have done the last few years. Uh, it is, it is our privilege to be human, to make our own choice. And um, I think you'll only see how strong your free will is and that it's really there if you're ever asked to do something that is so hard that you may even have to leave behind those you love for the sake of doing it. In other words, the price that you will have to pay to exercise your free will in the right way will call your attention to the fact that, my God, I really have free will because I'm about to use it. Yeah, for sure. And, and it's terrifying, <laughs> but I, it's what I, it's what is, it is one of the highest things that the human being can, can have is free will. Lord have mercy. Jesus Christ. Thank you for Ilana Freeland. Oh my God. I feel so happy that she is on this planet right now because we really need her we need her work i had goosebumps during parts of that she was fucking powerful yeah it was intense it's really great again i i selfishly i love talking to people like her because it just reinforces and bolsters my intuition and the things that i have known my whole life and uh, just recalibrates my brain when I start to go, oh, well, maybe. And, you know, she s- speaks truth to power, you know, and, and we need that. Yes. And and really the books, at least the, fir- the third one, excuse me, is so, so thorough with so many footnotes. Um, it's just, I mean, 
after reading that, if you can't <laughs> grasp well, all the things that are going on, then you you really probably shouldn't be reading books uh, because she just lays it out so clearly and concisely and has obviously done all the footwork that it takes to uh, parse all of this out in very, very uh, fine detail. It's really uh, it's it's not just dry information either. It's very well written and it's very compelling and it makes you want to dive deeper into it. And she definitely goes there. Yeah, I I want to have her back on and talk oh, yeah. about MK Ultra and you know mind control and the the whole machinations of that and how that is interwoven with. Uh, 5G and the EMFs and, and how all of these things are connected because I do think that they are all connected and I think that it's there's a possibility and a potentiality that we have as humans to wake up from this mesmerism and I think that's one of the reasons that we are doing these shows. You know, we could talk about very benign, very easy subjects, you know, kind of skim the surface of what people would call conspiracies. But we go there. We really go into the dark night of the soul and try to face these these predators. And I think it's important stuff. I think we are doing things that really matter. And I think having people on like Alana it just makes what we're doing so much better and such a richer journey. And it's stuff that needs to be looked at. Uh, You can't ignore it um, because that's the whole reason that it exists is because it's being ignored by most of the people on earth. Um, And so the only way that you can, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, grapple with it is to get through it. You have to get past it and you have to get above it. Uh, you have to get through the freak out period. And there's a big one. I mean, I heard stuff <laughs> during this uh, conversation tonight that I, and I listened to a lot of Alana interviews uh, that I hadn't heard in any other interview. Uh, and it was a different level of freak out <laughs> for me. Uh, the soul stuff, the reincarnation stuff, that gets under my skin, that hits home, because I always thought that was the safe place. But I have to get past that point, because that's just a stage. Um, Whatever technology exists can only do so much to nature. Um, Nature will always come back. Nature will always mutate and find a way past that. Flowers will always shoot up in the cracks of the sidewalk. Um, you can decimate Earth over and over and over again, and it will always come back. So I don't think we can be manipulated that easily, even on that level. I think there's a way to get past it, and this is just a step in finding out how to do that. It's part of these soul contracts that we have made and these karmic agreements that we've made. And this is why you and I are together. This is why Alana... Freeland is alive in this lifetime. This is why Rudolf Steiner was alive and he was a prophet. And I, I, in my heart of hearts, in my soul, in my belief of uh, the capacity of human consciousness and of soul consciousness, I think that we have been brought together together to be able to shine light in these dark corners because that's what we're supposed to do. I think that's what we're here to do. And it's not to be fearful. It's not to uh, bend down and, and, you know, just go along with it. I think that we are doing what we have been put on this planet to do. And, it's a it's an intense journey that we're on, but it's a it's a very powerful one. So we just have to keep going and trust in our uh, our soul's path and what we're what we are what have, what we have been designed for. Design. 
Were we just created by some grand scientist? No. I'm by just kidding. Jesus Christ, by God, by God, by the God consciousness that is so beyond. This is what she's saying, that 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 these predators, they uh, abhor divinity. They abhor this energy because... It's so powerful and it's so all encompassing that that's why they're trying to destroy it. Yeah, I was just joking about that. Um, yeah, I mean, why would they go through all this trouble uh, if we were so easy to um, so easy to control? Um, uh, well, there are people that are easy to control. There and are, that's and most what, of them are actually. right, and that's and that's what this this whole past two years has proven and shown is how compliant people, a majority of people would be. But consciousness and mind precedes all, if not creates all. So uh, when it comes down to that, then that that is important. The way you manifest your consciousness is of utter importance because you're creating reality with that consciousness. So... If you just bend over and go, well, all the virologists say this, then that's right. the world you're going to live in. But if you listen to your own inner guide and your own direct experience of life and what your gut is telling you and what your soul is telling you, then that's going to lead you in a direction and it's going to be a different direction than most of the world because they're not operating from that frequency. And I've just come to realize that i i think i was humble for many years and i was like oh i'm you know i'm not that big of a deal i'm just to have some weird ideas and you know anybody could have these ideas but i've come to the place where i don't think that's as common as i liked would have liked to have thought i feel like especially during the last two and a half years that maybe i do think a lot differently than most of the people that I come in contact with. And that's not to make me special by any means. If anything, it makes me feel like a freak. But I I think I've also come to terms with that's something that I also should cherish just because it's something that doesn't happen very often and I don't feel reflected by it uh, in my day-to-day life very much except for my partner, thank goodness, and my children. Um yeah, I think I've learned that that's a good thing. That's a, it's okay to 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 not think like everybody else. It's okay to look at things differently. That doesn't mean that it's wrong. Um, that means that I just have a an awareness of things that most people haven't taken the time to cultivate, um, or don't find it important because they're busy chasing after money or status or whatever. I have seen a tremendous. Uh, development in your journey in the past four years and one thing that I have seen is that you're far more cognizant about where you are steering your psyche and your ship and I think that's something that's happened throughout this whole jab COVID narrative and and that whole nightmare is that what it it did is it really forced some people to wake up and it and it put other people to sleep and with you I have seen this huge awakening and and a huge coming into your own power and so much of that process has been understanding that your thoughts are important and where and the and the things that you are feeding in your subconscious are important and and where you put your energy is important and so i think you're not as um asleep because We've had so many amazing conversations with really incredible people who have just reinforced your your reality and, and I think have helped you to feel not so alone. And so I think that's a really important part of what we're doing is that we're doing that for each other and we are 
a support system for each other, but we're also doing it for the people who are listening. And I hope you all understand that is that you are not alone in this space that you're in. If you are questioning your reality or the narrative that you're being fed or, or attempting to question that, then just know that there's other people that are in the same place that you're in. And this is not a foregone conclusion. This is not these things that are going on. They're not, it's not over. So we don't have to be fearful that quote unquote, they have won. They haven't won shit. Mm -hmm. This is still a battle and we are still at war. And the most important thing for you to do in my perspective and in my opinion is don't watch pornography. Don't feed the beast. Don't eat a bunch of shit and think that you're going to have a clear mind. You have to hone this vessel that you have been given, this human body, this form, this magical being that you are. Your duty is to keep it in as pristine condition as you possibly can. It's not a fucking meat suit. This is, you, you are so beyond that. So just understand that and, and really treat yourself as a divine being. And I think that that's the, that is going to be the thing that propels us forward. It doesn't take eight mil, billion people to wake up. It takes you waking up. You, this one individual, that's all it takes. That is the reality that you are creating is your own in your brain. And don't keep it to yourself. Go out and be brilliant around other people. And they will hopefully take your cue. If not, they will have something else to reflect back at them, probably what they're not used to having reflected back at them. And that's how it fucking works. That's really how it works. Exactly. It sounds simplistic, but that's that's all it boils down to. That is all that it boils down to. Yeah. And <laughs> just answering back. Like, you know, when when we watch television, there was a point where we were watching Hulu and they're playing these mind controlling commercials and you know Chris his son I would would say no <laughs> no like just you, you can block it you can block this mesmerism you can answer back as Alana was saying like you we have to be able to do that in these moments where we stop it where we just say nope I'm not accepting that <laughs> whatever information is coming through that doesn't resonate with my soul's journey I am putting a wall up and saying not not today Satan I just laugh at it and then fart out loud <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't actually, because I've never actually farted in front of Hunter. Not once. No. Nope. <laughs> Unless I did it in my sleep, and it made its way into your dreams. Oh, your nightmares. <laughs> oh, On gosh. that note. Hey, it's, we'll be here all week. Um, yeah. So anyway, Alana was super powerful. God, I can't wait to have her back on. She's yeah. fucking amazing. Um, it was fantastic to have a conversation with her. Uh yeah, and there's so, so much more to talk. I think I've got to two questions out of about 24. <laughs> so there's yeah. much more to go into for sure. But we went we went where we were supposed to go. Yeah. That's what I love about it. That's the, Yeah, we went to places that I'd never heard her talk about yeah. before, like she said. So it was really amazing. Yeah. So, thank you, Alana. Yeah, I think that's what we're here to do. You know, I think we... We stay awake and we wake other people up in, you know, so it does there. She's not on autopilot. There are, I think, stories and, and bios backgrounds that I think are necessary for people to get out, yeah. maybe at least for their first visit yeah. sometimes yeah. because it's very pertinent to who they are and where they're yeah. coming from. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's also uh, fantastic and magical when it goes someplace that you never would have thought that it could go yeah and i i always assume and i could very wrongly assume this that we have guests on because so many of our guests are recommendations from our listeners that we absolutely love 
I I assume that most of our listeners have some degree of a background on this person. So when we go down these alleys and take these turns that that it's exciting for the person because they know the backstory already. So mm-hmm. it's good to have kind of a balance of like, this is the basic primer of who this person is, but we can also take them on a magical journey. Exactly. Of self-discovery and redemption. Exactly. And, and they take us too. We're along for the ride. It's amazing. Absolutely. All right. Thank you, every single goddamn one of you, for listening. God um, bless it. We appreciate <laughs> you so much, and and we don't damn you. We bless you. Goddamn, it's just a, <laughs> it's, it's just a yeah. colloquialism, right? Uh, let's don't let's, concentrate on every syllable. Let's let's, let's not. It's you important. do. I'll. You say no to commercials. I'll laugh at them. How about that? You say tomato. I'm going to bless people and see the the good energy that we can pour out over these airwaves. Okay. (laughs) You massage your crystals and I'm going to be over here farting out loud. Anyway. (laughs) No, thank you all so much for listening. Hopefully you were as um, chuffed by that conversation as we were. And uh, yeah, keep listening. It's very important that you do. And hopefully it will give you something positive to think about and take out into the world. I'm into it. Me too. Hey. We love you all. We do. And, uh, yeah, keep your eyes peeled for great stuff. And we'll see you on the other side. It's coming down the mountain. Don't make it rustle. Boo. (laughs) Ta-ta. To hear the full-length version of this episode... Get access to exclusive and early episodes and participate in our monthly Zoom meetups for as little as $3 per month. Just click the Patreon link in the episode notes or visit patreon.com slash the melt podcast. Contributing financially will help to make this podcast my full-time gig that I can devote more time to and allow me to create more content. Other ways of contributing would be giving us a favorable review or rating wherever you get your podcasts, subscribing to us on YouTube, spreading the word wherever you and your tribe congregate, or just by sending us your positive thoughts and intentions. In a quantumly intertwined and holographic multiverse, these also go a long way. Thank you.